This is the city, Los Angeles, California. It's not a bad place for a boy to do his growing up. He can get a fine education, and it's free. Read all the books he wants for nothing. The scenery's hard to beat, and it doesn't cost anything either. There are a fair number of jobs available, and the pay's pretty good. He can go surfing in the morning and skiing in the afternoon. We have just about every kind of sport you can think of and some of the best coaches in the country. We have parks, all kinds of recreational facilities, and a fine climate. Sometimes none of these things is enough. It takes bigger challenges and bigger excitement. When it gets too big, then it becomes my job. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Thursday, October 13th, it was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of juvenile division. The boss is Captain Jack Morris. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. We returned to Georgia Juvenile from two routine calls. It had been a quiet watch. You sure look tired, Joe. How can you tell? I've been watching you all night. You have? Well, what'd you think? Well, I could use a cup of coffee. Just coffee? That's right. That's not enough, Joe. You need something to eat. I do. You're lethargic, sluggish, depleted. What you mean is you're getting hungry. Well, that's the difference between us, Joe. I keep my eye on my blood sugar level. You do? That's the safest thing a person can do, is keep their eye on their blood sugar level. How do you manage to do that? I just told you. Sergeant Friday? Yeah. Kiefer, 2A27. We responded to a possible car stripping over on Vermont. We found about eight of them, all boys, hanging around a white firebird. They took off as soon as we came up. We chased one of them all the way to his home. He and his mother are outside. Yeah. His name's Harold Rustin. The car had been hot-wired. The engine was still running. All right. You want to bring the boy in? The FI card. Or oh, something else. Yeah. Found this in his pocket. <laughs> At 10 p.m., we advised the subject, Harold F. Rustin, of his rights. He waived his right to an attorney and said he'd talk to us. You live at this address with your parents? Just my mother. How old are you? 17. What were you doing on Vermont tonight? Nothing. What's this screwdriver for? <laughs> Nothing special. You must have a reason for carrying it around. I was just carrying it. Who are those other boys? I don't know. They got names. Now, who are they? I never saw them before. I told you I was just hanging around. 8.30 at night with a bunch of kids you never saw before. I met him outside the show. Is that where you were, the movies? Uh-huh. Do you always take a screwdriver to the movies with you? Yeah, sometimes, I guess. Go on. Well, I met these guys, you see. We were just clowning around. Somebody said, why don't we take a ride? It was a dumb show, so I came over here with them. But I didn't do anything. Then why did you run? I don't know. Everybody else started running. Do you know who owns the car? One of them, I guess. It's registered to a Miss Leona Tellman. Was it your idea to steal the car? <laughs> no. Whose idea was it? It was nobody's. Now, didn't somebody say, let's grab a car and take a ride, something like that? No. You all walked straight over to the car from the theater? Mm-hmm. Did you get in and start it up? Well, now, how could I do that? I don't have a key. Somebody else started it. Yeah, one of the other guys. You just stood around and watched. That's right. And didn't it strike you a little funny? What? The other guy didn't have a key either. check the subject's name against our own files and CJI. Harold Rustin had no record of previous arrests. We decided to talk to his mother, Mrs. Eunice Barham Rustin, who was waiting outside. 9.57 p.m. We explained the situation to the boy's mother. Mrs. Rustin told us that she had been divorced for six years. There were no other children. She'd been having trouble recently with the boy, but nothing serious. Harold was an average student. He had left the house around 7.30 that evening, saying he was going to a movie. What time did you expect him back? I don't know if it was a double feature or not. 
Around 11.30, I suppose. Do you let him go out on school nights very often? I thought so. Well, I won't stand for it. I beg your pardon? Trying to blame me, say that I'm at fault. That's what you're leading up to, isn't it? No, ma'am. We're just trying to get some information, Ms. Rustin. Now, you must see a lot of it. Thoughtless parents. Negligent, cruel even. People that don't deserve to have children. Yes, ma'am, we do. I have been a good mother. I've made mistakes, but you can ask anybody who knows us. When George and I got divorced, the court gave me custody. There was no question about it. The judge could tell. I'm not like the people you usually get here. Yes, ma'am. It has not been easy. A woman by herself with a growing boy on her hands, I've had my work cut out for me. But I've given Hal love and attention. I've always seen that he's dressed properly, that he eats the right things. I worry about him. I've done everything I can do. I've been expecting something like this. I knew it was coming. He's been giving you trouble at home? Hal's getting harder to handle all the time. I don't like what I see ahead of me. I've told him time and again. I've pleaded with him. But it's no use. It's genetic. Is that so? It's inherited. He takes after his father. Yes, ma'am. That's where I made my mistake. Is there anything you can do? We can try. Sometimes it works. What's that? We can give him the 40 cent tour. Ten fifteen p.m. We met with Lieutenant Bill Hall, the watch commander, and Sergeant Bob Parker, the watch supervisor. They agreed we didn't have enough evidence to detain Harold Rustin. We took the subject on a tour of the Georgia facilities. An important part of a juvenile officer's job is the way he handles a young offender's first contact with the law. If the officer's lucky, he can get through to him. He may prevent any repetition. You never know, but you keep trying. That's what it's like, huh? That's it. Now, do you understand the booking procedure? Yeah. The fingerprinting? Uh-huh. How we take the mug shots, the booking numbers, and all that? Yes, sir. And you got a good look at those cells, didn't you? And the six kids inside? Yes, sir. Well, now, what do you think, Harold? I don't want any part of it. Those other six boys? Yes, sir. Do you think any of them did? Can I take him home now? Not just yet, ma'am. We'd like you to hear this, too, Mrs. Rustin. Now, you're feeling pretty impressed right now, but that may wear off in a few days. You may start to think to yourself, it wasn't too bad, nothing much happened to me. You may start to brag about it. You'll bump into those kids again, and they'll pat you on the back. You'll be a hero for keeping your mouth shut. Now, this is your first time in trouble. We don't want to give you a police record. What do you want to do when you grow up? He's been talking about being an engineer. Yeah, always been pretty good with my hands. We know. It's tough enough getting into college these days. A police record won't help, will it? No, sir. Now, you know the difference between right and wrong, and you know when you're breaking the law. You don't have any reason to. Nobody does, but you don't even have a reason you can kid yourself with. This is a Form 910, a juvenile contact report. We filled one of these out on you and what happened tonight. A copy's gonna stay in our files. If you're ever in trouble with the police again, somebody will pull this out and see that you were picked up once under suspicious circumstances. This does not give you a police record. It's just for information and guidance. Now, if you're smart, you'll take it as a warning and you'll see to it that this is the last piece of paper we ever have to fill out on you. And it's easy enough. Just stay out of trouble. All right, you can take him home now, Ms. Rustin. Thank you, Sergeant. Don't you let us see you back here again. Listen to him, son. I've had enough heartache. Hey, Sergeant. Yeah? What about my screwdriver? What about it? I want it back. Second, 4 p.m. Bill and I reported into work as usual. Joe? Yeah, Bob. Took a couple of calls for you. This one, woman wanted to know if you could drop by tomorrow and see her during school hours. Thank you. Mrs. Rustin. Thursday, November 3rd, 2.05 p.m. We had made arrangements that morning to talk to Mrs. Rustin. 
we drove to 3331 Vale Boulevard, one of the better residential sections. I'm sorry to get you out here like this, but I don't know what else to do. I'm at my wit's end. Well, what can we do for you, Mrs. Rustin? It's Harold. You've got to help me. Yes, ma'am, if we can. After that night, after you talked to him, he was fine for about a week or so. You frightened him. He listened to me, he stayed home, he was just fine. But the last little while, it's gotten worse than ever. I can't control him. He just comes and goes, he stays out to all hours. The other night, he simply walked out without a word. Didn't come back until after midnight. Do you have any idea where he's going, what he's doing? Shows, hanging around, that's, that's all he tells me. Well, does he mention any names, who he's running around with? I haven't any idea. You know, there's some fine children here in this neighborhood, a perfectly lovely girl just two doors down. I've encouraged him to get friendly with them, but he won't. You've got to pick him up again. Can you tell us what he's done? You mean, has he broken the law in any way? Yes, ma'am, that's right. No, not that I know of. And I certainly wouldn't inform on my own son. I just want you to pick him up and talk to him. Frighten him again. I told him that you've been keeping careful watch on him and that that's what you'd do if he didn't behave himself. I don't think he believed me. I suppose I didn't have any right to do that. No, ma'am. Well, you can understand. I need some kind of hold over him. Well, Miss Rustin, you've got a pretty good one already. How's that? You're his mother. Eleven thirty-five p.m. We got a call to report to Central Receiving Hospital. AID had brought in four juveniles involved in a traffic accident. Doctor, check this one over and release them. You'll have to talk to the others tomorrow if they're able to talk. What happened? Stolen car, brand new Corvette. We clocked them at one eighteen on the freeway. They went off the road, took out about eighty feet of steel fence, tore the car apart. Wonder any of them are still alive. Andrew Rayner, 16. Are my folks here yet? They'll be notified. I told him his rights. He's agreed to talk. Where'd you get the car? I told him already. Tell us. Outside the store on Western Avenue. Who was driving? I was. Tell them what you told us, the whole thing. This afternoon after school, we were just fooling around, seven or eight of us. We made this deal. It was Hal started it, Hal Rustin. What kind of deal? We'd start out at 8 and each one of us grab a car, then we'd meet on the freeway on the Melrose on-ramp at 9. That gave us an hour, you see. Then we'd drag out the freeway headed west. It didn't count unless you got a car could do over 100. That's what it was. Where's Harold Rustin now? Him? He never showed up. We hung around, waited for him. After a while, we took off by ourselves. I had to make one run anyway. Why? What for? Hal said I couldn't do it. Said I didn't have the class. Are you gonna talk to him? That's right. Then you tell him. Tell him what? How fast I was going. They clocked me at 118. Yeah, you sure showed him, didn't you? We continued questioning Andrew Rayner. He gave us the names of the other boys. All of them were students at Milton Fletcher High School. The subject was booked under 602 WIC for 10,851 VC and released to the custody of his parents. 12.10 a.m., Bill and I left Georgia Juvenile and drove to the Rustin home. Hal's asleep. His light went out over an hour ago. How long has he been home? Oh, since before dinner. Is anything wrong? There's been an accident. Oh, I am sorry, but he's been here all evening. I don't know whether you've had a chance to talk to him yet or not. No, we haven't. You have? No, ma'am. Well, whatever it is, he's been as good as gold. Mrs. Rustin asked us not to disturb her son, and we agreed to talk to him later. Friday, November 4th, 9.15 a.m., Bill picked me up at home, and we drove to Milton Fletcher High School. In the office of the vice principal, Philip Geiger, we interrogated the boys whose names we had gotten the preceding night from Andrew Rayner. They all had been at home or with friends that evening. They all denied any prior knowledge of the car theft or of having attempted to steal a car themselves. We interrogated Harold Rustin. He admitted having made a joking remark about stealing cars and having a challenged drag race on the freeway. He said he was surprised that anybody took it seriously. 
He got frightened. That's what happened. Yeah. You know, I knew who you wanted to talk to almost before you asked me. I've had them in here before. Have you had much trouble with them? Oh, a certain amount. They're pretty careful around school. You hardly ever see one of them by himself. It's always a group, three, four, or five. Yes, yeah, sir. One of them alone, two even, won't cause you much trouble. They all come from good socioeconomic backgrounds. They have no reason to get into trouble. But you put a bunch of them together, let them get started showing off, each one trying to top the others. 118 on the freeway. Mm, yeah. It's pretty hard to top that. Saturday, January 7th, eight weeks went by. We had no further contact with Harold Rustin. Two cars were stolen in the general area during the Christmas vacation. Both were late model, high performance sports cars and both were recovered several miles away without any damage. Both cars had been wiped clean of fingerprints. 3.05 p.m. Woman phoned in a complaint, birthday party going on next door to her. What's the matter, too noisy? Bunch of kids ran a car up on her front porch. At 3.07 p.m., we left Georgia Juvenile and drove over to 1217 West Mayberry Street. It took us 16 minutes to reach the scene of the complaint. Friday in Gannon Juvenile. Lathrop, 2A12. There were three carloads of them, maybe 12, 14 boys. We're trying to get the names and all right now. Two of the cars took off as soon as we turned into the block. They really laid a patch out there. This one right here was poked up on the porch like this when we got here. What about license numbers on the other two cars? The boys don't know. They stole them. Get your heads up. I've seen you before. You go to Fletcher High, don't you? Kid next door, he got cut up pretty bad. <laughs> Friday, Juvenile. Had a glass door back there, and somebody shoved him right through. We've called an ambulance. Who owns this house? I do. My name's Friday, Juvenile Division. Mike Chatterton, young hoodlums. You want to tell me what happened here? It's my daughter's birthday. Nora, honey, she's 16. We're giving her a little party, maybe a dozen kids, no more. We didn't want anything big. About a half hour ago, maybe a little longer, a car pulled up. After that, I couldn't keep track of what was going on. They started fighting out and back, throwing the girls in the pool. I tried to break it up, and one of them hit me. How'd they get in? Well, the first bunch, they knocked on the door and asked if they could join the party. I didn't want to be a stuffed shirt. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want them here. Well, they seemed polite enough, so I let them in. There must have been another car somewhere. A bunch more came pushing them right behind me. A lot came in the back, too. Yeah? Hopped over the fence. They threw me in the pool first. That's what started the fighting. They tore the place up into everything. Oh, my kitchen, you ought to see it. I don't know how long it went on. They busted up the front porch. They got scared, I guess, when that young fellow went through the patio door. And well, they cleared out in a big hurry. Did you recognize any of them? All of them. Creeps. I go to school with them. Fletcher High? Yes. The absolute creeps of the world. I got a lot of names, Joe. Some of them are familiar. Miss Chatterton here can give you some more. Be all right if I look around, sir? Go ahead. Bill. Never noticed that before. Are there any guns missing? Oh, yes, yeah, 12 gauge over under shotgun. Bill called in the names of the subjects and the fact that one of them was now probably armed. He also requested a police photographer. I questioned the teenagers who had been party guests of the Chattertons. They all readily identified the 14 juveniles who had crashed the party and agreed that Harold Rustin had been among them. I took their names and addresses and arranged with a neighbor for them to telephone their parents and to be picked up. Lieutenant wants us back at the office to so bring us some kids in now. Yeah. About 15 minutes ago, a few miles down the boulevard, a green sedan full of juveniles pulled up at a bus stop. Senseless, Joe. Started giving a couple of men there a hard time. One of the men talked back. Guess he said something they didn't like. Absolutely senseless. Never saw the man before. Yeah. Blew his head off. Four eighteen p.m., Bill and I returned to the office. About four blocks down the boulevard from the bus stop, we spotted these kids running along the sidewalk. 
The car was just sitting out in the street two blocks behind him. The gun was lying on the front seat. Homicide been notified? Yeah, the gun's been printed and photographed. Which one's the oldest? This one, he's 17. We told them all their rights and they understand them. All right, would you take these two down the hallways? Right. What's your name? Vern Bayless. You been in a fight? You crashed the party at the Chatterton house. Yeah, but I didn't do it. Do what? Well, shoot that guy. I swear, I didn't think he'd do a crazy thing like that. Who did it? I don't know. Come on. I can't tell you. Yes, you can and you will. You know who was with you and he's got a name. Now, we want to hear it. Come on, let's have it. Harold Rustin. All three boys definitely identified Harold Rustin as the one who had fired the shot. Vern Bayless had been driving the car. They had gotten panicky, ditched the car, and started running. They had no idea where Harold Rustin was. 4.45 p.m., we had a hunch where we might find him. We drove out to the Rustin home. When we got there, the front door was ajar. Rustin! Rustin! All right, Rustin, come on down here. You heard me, move! Now, come on over here. Yes, sir, I'm coming. Listen, uh, you want to get my ma? She's out somewhere. You find her, all right? Yeah, we'll do that. Harold, you leave the front door open. Hi, ma. I'm glad you're home. What are these policemen doing here? Your boy's under arrest, Ms. Rustin. For what? Suspicion of murder. Dear God in here. Oh, come on, Ma. Don't listen to these guys. Are you sure? Yes, ma'am. We're sure. Oh, Harold. Why? Why? Haven't I given you everything? What more could I have done for you? Answer me, Harold. Answer me! <laughs> I don't think he can, Ms. Rustin. Why can't he? He doesn't have one. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. Harold Rustin was certified by juvenile court to be tried as an adult. On February 20th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The subject was found guilty of murder in the second degree. Because of his age, however, he was remanded to the custody of the California Youth Authority. <laughs> 